You are about to listen to a discussion on how to actually live out your faith in Christ, living it out loud within our messy and busy lives. The content of this discussion comes from our Wednesday night crew, pastoral preaching notes, and the live small group discussions these notes prompted, something we like to call a community-based learning experience. Come now, chew on this with us. What do you do when you don't get the benefits you know you deserve? I mean, really, everyone in society, everyone in your social group, they just give them to you because they, everybody knows you deserve this. What do you do when someone in authority who you really respect totally rearranges that paradigm in your world? This is Pastor Orlean Hasseltine along with Pastor Robin Bjornsson and our very own Otto Lundy and Bruce Nelson welcoming you today to this podcast on October some date in the beginning of October. Eight. <laughs> yes, I know it's October oh, 8th because last night was 7th. There you go. Yes, this was oh, discussed that, that's discussed works. in detail at the Wednesday Night Crew on October 7th. We are discussing who are the apostles and then last night and today on the podcast we're going to be discussing James the Greater or James the Great and there's a reason for that and it can get kind of messy as happened last night that there was this okay who are we talking about so I want to let you know when I say check the notes I mean you have all the freedom in the world to go check those study notes and they are posted on our website at realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday nights really looking forward to today's discussion as we rehash what we talked about last night. A little different format, we were a smaller crew, and so keeping all the conversation together was one great big bunch of interested people. And I so badly wanted to go back in my notes and verify something I had said where I had found it. But in my leadership head, hearing the Holy Spirit say, that's not the point of tonight, baby girl. You know, <laughs> it's like the point of tonight is to get to what we're at the end, the praying, what we prayed for, and correcting the notes. But it was really hard in my head to stop and not go verify. It's like, I know I've seen that. I'm absolutely positive I'm quoting somebody. And just to stop my brain from how it naturally progresses. You don't go any further until you verify what you just remembered to make sure that you have it right. and. I'm sure it, I, I don't think I'll watch the video we shot last night because I'm sure there was this lady standing up there pausing and everybody is waiting for her to do something. That would be me. <laughs> and I was like, no, we'll do it today on the podcast. Yay. So here we are. We're going to be enjoying our conversation about the Apostle James and who we think he could have been and piecing together perhaps the personality we think he might have had based on the evidence that we have for him. So part of that personification, or I should just say uh, part of it, no, it's not personification because he is a person, part of that process is to help us understand what it would be like to have been an apostle. Which one do we think we, we are the closest in personality to? And watching and contemplating how Jesus worked with that amazing personality, which is designed in there by God's distinct choice given to us when he created us, and how is that personality supposed to glorify Jesus? How is it supposed to be used by the Lord to love others in his name? And in the process, getting an idea, but it's not 100% accurate. It just gets us close to understanding who that individual is. Because for some odd reason, the apostles didn't post everything on social media, so we can't follow their trail. The best that we come, thank, thank you, Jesus, is looking at scripture, and then extra biblical literature, looking at biblical history and what they say. And that does help, because biblical history gives us the end of all the apostles' lives. We, we can see how they died. And in that process, we can go backwards to how they started. We have those two bookends. It's like, okay, this is what, and I love scripture because it is so transparent. It doesn't hide mm -hmm. our need to grow up. Yay! Mm -hmm. So watching that progression and to see who that they ended and in that lovely space in between. So we had a lot of that conversation last night and I think we're in for a lot more as we continue going with the second triad we step into next week. <laughs> the triad <laughs> of four <laughs> and looking at those individuals and we will now be moving into either Nathaniel or Bartholomew 
the same name, and the reason the Bartholomew is, is a play on his last name, how the Nathaniel goes out, but we'll get to that when we discuss him, or Philip or Thomas or Matthew, who is also called Levi. Those are the next four in this patronage society that are in the middle of these triads of the apostles and how they're structured. But before we get there, as a way of reminder, there are distinct qualifications needed in Scripture to be called an apostle. You had to witness the resurrection of Christ, yes. You had to be commissioned by Jesus to spread the gospel into the world, and the ministry that goes through you has to be proven by miraculous powers ordained by the Holy Spirit. And people had to see them and to know. It wasn't like you just arrived and said, hey, I'm an apostle. It didn't work that way. That community had to have witnessed those things. You had to live amongst them and show who you were before they are going to say anything about you being an apostle. We also discussed and looked at this um, interesting out of the Nelson's Christian, Liturg Christian Dictionary. They listed all of the artistic signs that are equated with the different apostles. And I love this idea that art is interpreting and communicating who these individuals were, mm -hmm. who these uh, fathers of our faith were. And it just helps for those especially who are extremely artistic and those who enjoy playing in the arts to get an idea. The individuals back in this day created this connection between this apostle and this sign. And I think it would be an interesting study to back up and see. It was just finding all the resources where we could see these pictures. Mm -hmm. and But that would take a professorship type study. And so if you know of one, anyone, let me know about the art of the apostles and where they are displayed and what they look like and who did it and why. Because I'm not sure some of them why they chose the things they did, especially mm -hmm. the one last night. Because mm -hmm. it talks about James the Greater. It was a scallop shell, a pilgrim staff, or a gourd bottle because he's the patron saint of pilgrims. He is connected with pilgrims. And I don't quite know how mm -hmm. that came to be. But that, if you see that sign in it, in what would you say, historical Christian art, that is signifying him. Andrew, it's the X-shaped cross because that is how he was crucified. And then John, it's a cup with a winged serpent because he drank poison after making the sign of the cross, which is part of the history that they had. So we're going to look at some of these. Many of them are attached to how they were martyred. So that's why I would think James the Greater, his would be a sword, but that is not what it says there. So just looking at that, it's like, that's kind of an interesting, hmm, how in the world did that become the piece of art that represented him? So there is a piece of history I haven't discovered yet that got to that point from what we discussed last night at the Wednesday Night Crew. And also to remember, and this came up last night in the group of discussion, this concept of patronage. Without understanding this, this was a delightful discovery in this study, it is really hard to interpret how the, the disciples interacted, who was a leader, how it was respected, and how Jesus, I think, Jesus turned the apple cart of society, societal expectations upside down with the way he put the apostles in this patronage order. Because he specifically put people in spots so everyone would see who has leadership capabilities according to Jesus' decision. And I have to wonder, and I'm really looking forward to when we get to talk about Peter and get to do, because there's a lot of information on Peter and John. Those are the two that we have the most information on. And to just see what history, Christian history says about Peter. Mm -hmm. And because I have to ask myself, we know that he, him and Andrew, worked with James and John, and James and John's dad, Zebedee, they worked and were partners in the fishery business that they had. And who partnered with whom? Who started it? Did they all, do, I mean, they mm -hmm. are connected, they grew up together. Was it the Zebedee's organization and Peter became part of it, or did Peter do really well as this self-made man and the Zebedee's became, because they needed more people? I'm guessing, according to what I've read, that because Zebedee is listed so often, he was such a prominent man that it was their fishery business and Peter and Andrew became partners, not employees. They were partners in the business. So that is an interesting piece of information when we get to discuss James' James's standing within the discipleship group. But looking at the patronage, this idea that there are patrons, there are those who have something, whether it's a skill, whether it's wealth, whether it is education, and they have clients who come and get that 
from them and they work in that situation and also a patron could become a client of someone else if they need someone else's help Jesus is a great example he was a client of those who supported him financially but he was also the patron of the Apostles so when they start listing the Apostles and they are usually listed in very similar order and they say Philip was reading about him yesterday Philip is always listed as number five I read that yeah. all right I need to go back and look at all the list of the names of the Apostles especially in Acts and see if Philip really is number five and then you have to look through different versions depending on what version they were talking about so if that is true Philip would be number one in the middle triad mm -hmm. and he kind of has a really intriguing personality but it's like okay so that all is due to this concept of patronage in society and it was fun having that conversation well where do you get the list how can you look it's like it's called patronage it's listed that way and as you go through scripture you're going to see them listed and in a lot of places and this was also brought up in what I was studying Peter especially in Acts chapter 1 when it lists who all the apostles and all the disciples that were getting ready to go out of the upper room there's Peter and then there's James so Peter and James and in some versions it was they weren't listed together I think it was Peter Andrew and James but in the uh, New King James version it was Peter and James and they said that they believed that that was the list that was how G how they were set up in the structure of the Apostles structure after Jesus ascended that people seen Peter and then there was James and then Andrew and John were in there I don't know if Andrew came next and then John but that is how that was structured so they would say that it looks like James was an authority right under Peter so that is just out there to kind of get our brain wrapped around as a way of reminder we know that James was called by Jesus to become a disciple and we can look at Mark 1 16 through 20 it's also listed in Matthew 4 18 through 22 and Luke 5 1 through 11 but in there we have Jesus going along the Sea of Galilee which he knew he hung out in this area and there is pretty decent evidence that James and John are cousins of Jesus that their mom is Mary's mother is Jesus's mother Mary that they're sisters so if that is true this area it's not like he just beamed down oh be my disciple you be my disciple no there was relationship all the time he spent praying about who to bring into the inner circle he had personal information he knew what it was like to do business with them he knew what it was like to hang out in a social situation how did they treat the people who were considered under them in this patronage system how, what kind of person how well did they learn did they listen to correction I mean all of these things had to be going through his head talking and in prayer with God the Father asking for and I have to wonder if that list boom was there when he started putting it together mm -hmm. so here is the beginning of it so he's walking along the Sea of Galilee and he saw Simon and Andrew the brother of Simon casting a net into the sea because they were fishermen and Jesus said follow me and I will make you fishers of men and immediately they left their nets and followed him so did they they knew okay Jesus is putting together the inner crew and that's us so and notice that we have Simon Peter listed first and then his brother and immediately in verse 18 here in Mark 1 they left their nets and followed him and then he went on a little further and guess who he's seen he's seen James the son of Zebedee and John his brother who were in their boat mending the nets and immediately he called them hey and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and they followed Jesus so those are the the top four that's our first triad in the patronage system of the disciples that he worked with and notice that James is listed before John because we believe he was the older brother so why in the world do they give these and this is fun we had a discussion before we started on the podcast today why in the world they call him James the greater and it's like well you know Excuse what me. there's a lot of them there's a lot of James and they needed to delineate who was who and so they had these I don't know what would it wouldn't actually be a nickname but it would be like a junior like James junior or James senior type of thing because they are not related that way but they are all working in the same organization so it's just like Pastor Robin calling you Robin Celeste and we had another Robin on staff so it's like there was this delineation of who was who so this was what they were attempting to do so we have James the less which goes over so well in today's society <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh, yes 
Name me, Orlean the Less. I like that. <laughs> Lesser than. That's right where we go. But it means James the Younger. And we will be getting to him on this podcast dis- discussing who he is. And he has a brother. I can't remember if it was Levi they think he's a brother. But anyway, he's related to someone they think amongst the other disciples. So it's interesting to see these brother relationships amongst the calling here. And then we have St. James. So James the Less, nobody confuses him with James the Greater or St. James. And St. James is? Jesus' brother. brother. Yes, who became a believer after Jesus' resurrection. So there's St. James, and then there is James the Greater. And those two get mixed up. And I proved it last night. Confusing and not checking out my timeline, which is one of my favorite parts of history, especially when you're trying to put people in a line. It's like, could you just put their birth and their death date every mm-hmm. time their name shows up? Mm-hmm. So, and then you, you do a historical event, and then just put that there. Don't make me look for it. Just every <laughs> time you print it, could you just please? So, <laughs> I, I know, a lazy scholar. Like, oh, okay. So here we have those delineations of who they are. So we know that James was called James the Great or James the Greater. He was part of the first triad of four four in the patronage system of the apostles. He is firstborn in his family. He is older than his brother John, who has this really intriguing best friend relationship with Jesus that had to defy the patronage system Mm -hmm. because it's just weird. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just odd. I wonder how everybody took that. But how Jesus handled things obviously helped calm some nerves, but not all the time, as we're going to find out. Jesus gave John and James a fun nickname. Boanerges, I think it is called. The sons, he called them Boanerges, the sons of thunder. He only said it one time, where he called Simon Peter all of the time. So because there is that contrast, we know Jesus was up to something when he said that nickname. He was trying to help shape, form, and in my imagination, when he did this, listed here in Mark 3, he didn't just, and you guys are known as the sons of thunder, and this big loud, blah, 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 on the black background. It didn't, it wasn't like that, because here, because Simon is being called Peter, and that means rock-like steadfastness. You're going to be a steadfast cog in this organization. And I'm calling you Peter because I want you to remember this. Names mean something. That's a totally different type of study. Very interesting. The naming of things in the Old Testament, it's a fascinating study because it was prophetic. You gave Mm -hmm. them these names as a prophetic, what you knew God would use them for. Mm -hmm. So here, Jesus is doing that for Simon Peter. So when he brings this up, do you think the other apostles laughed at them? Laughed a bit? Because I'm wasn't. laughing now. Yeah, it wasn't <laughs> like this pet name because it's not used again. It's interesting. The first thing I think of when I see it is um, uh, the Latin. I mean, mm-hmm. the uh, energeo, mm-hmm. the energy yes. involved in that, and. <laughs> yeah, you guys have way too much energy. No, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and, and that's kind of my thought. It's like you know, you can see like in his naming of Simon Peter, that being a prophetic declaration, and and mm. the there's a hope for the future in that naming. Yes, this one strikes me as I am making a statement about where we're at right now. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. What do you think, Steve? What do you think his purpose was in giving him that nickname in this one spot? I think that was to open their eyes a little bit there. Mm-hmm. Good point. Yeah. Come mm-hmm. on, Sons yep. of Thunder. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's, we're, we're not here to <laughs> fire and brimstone coming down on you to turn or burn. You know, it's a... Hey, just to, just to, just to, uh, Do you think they tattooed it on their back? <laughs> Turn or burn. Turn or burn. Yeah. And then regretted it later. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And then One greatly of those regret it. Later. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so in my imagination, when he said this, because whenever we, whenever I, and I think most people are like this, you read scripture, and you, you have this picture of how Jesus is speaking, and he's talking this way, and he's exp- he is the ever patient parent mode, but in yeah. this. Situation, having raised strong-willed children, having raised four kids in really close proximity of birth age, I believe he got very close to their handsome faces together 
maybe even grabbing the front of their tunic and just kind of like, guys, this is your nickname. And just looking at them. And I think everybody, I don't think anybody laughed. I think this was a statement of, this is going to change mm -hmm. because it wasn't brought up again. I don't, I don't think it was a, a fun experience. I think it's listed there for us to learn from. Right. But that's just my parental side. We've all had to do that. Mm -hmm. Those of us who love children and, and mm -hmm. want them to grow to be who they are called to be. Mm -hmm. And it's like, this name is not going to be yours. And that's why I think it is interesting how that nickname, when people write fictionally about James and John, they use it as a positive thing. And so it's interesting. We know it's there, but we need to see what happens with that as they grow in Jesus. Because they, John has his personality, but James's personality, as we're going to find out, has a lot of energy to it. So what is, what is the Lord going to do? Is James the patron saint of the strong-willed child? <laughs> or, or the hyperactive child? I don't know. It's like, here is James. So we know that Jesus gave Peter that nickname for being steadfast and used it all of the time prophetically proclaiming who this man is going to be. <laughs> and then the process of denying Christ three times and then repenting those three times mm -hmm. to reconnect himself back into the apostles and being the leader. So what did Jesus see? I mean, he knew this was going to happen, and he knew he needed to have this conversation with Peter after his resurrection to reconnect him. So why did Jesus use this name for James and John? We don't know for certain, but we know it was specifically said, and it was said once. And honestly, Pastor O, that's one of the reasons why I'm really appreciating this study and all of the questions that you have us asking, because I realize as we're going apostle by apostle, I have studied for years, but I have held what turns out to be some caricatures of these people because of some of the assumptions that I didn't even realize I was making. Yes. And so talking about their personality and highlighting that Jesus mentioned this specifically has actually been really very helpful to my study because I'm finding myself relating to them as real people, not the, oh. you know. <laughs> yes. So thank you for all of your study and, and for provoking those questions because it's really been very helpful. And it really helps. Study to just personally grow is fine. But study when you can talk about it and share it with others. And that's why I like the actually chewing on this piece we have with the Wednesday night crew every Wednesday night because we need input. We need other people to say, hey, wait a minute, what about this? Hey, wait mm -hmm. a minute. I, I mean, I love the question last night, what is up with this listing of things in order? And it's like, it's the patronage system, you know, mm -hmm. that's on the notes of, of week one on this series. Who are the apostles? You go pull up. Uh, week number one, and you're going to see it, I think it's week one, or is it week two? Maybe it's in week two under Andrew, where we, we list the patronage system, this understanding of what the, and it really helps mold. And that's where this idea of James the Greater, it's a name that seems to be fluid, because I found it listed somewhere. I took it as this James, but it really was talking about Jesus' brother. So mm. we'll get to that in a moment. Here we have in Luke 5, this is where did James, and this was a question brought up in a few different commentaries, what did James wrestle with, with his personality? What was, we have an idea of, of Peter's personality being impetuous, and we have a, a, a picture of John the Apostle's personality being one that understood how to lead, but also how to serve, and how to become a support, an actual support support for Jesus, to the point where Jesus asked him to take care of his mother while he was you know, gone, ascending into heaven to take care of my mom till she meets me up here, please, John. So those are really interesting portraits of those two individuals. So we're wondering, the question comes up, was James really intense and very fiery? Was he the reason why they got that nickname? And John, his passion just attached right to it because that's his older brother. So here in Luke 9, we read, and it talks about when Jesus and the troop were heading to Passover, and instead of going around Samaria, Jesus went through Samaria all the time. He ministered to the Samaritans. And I didn't state this last night. Excuse me. Here I can look for my notes. Okay. He showed nothing but goodwill toward the Samaritans. He healed a Samaritan's leprosy. He accepted water from a Samaritan woman at the well, and actually she became the first missionary for him. Um, he's, 
he stayed in that woman's village for two days, living with the Samaritans, which were considered contaminated people by the rest of Hebrew culture at the time. He made a Samaritan a hero, one of his best known parables. And he commanded his disciple to preach the gospel in Samaria. And he lived what he preached because he went through Samaria instead of around it. And the reason why um, the Jewish nation didn't walk through Samaria, went around it, is because the Samaritans were half Syrian and half Jews by birth. They were intermixed. They treated them like mongrels because they come from a reminder of their history that was horrid and they weren't supposed to marry outside of their, their ethnic crew and all of these things. And, and think what we want in today's society of this. This is what this culture was like. This is what it was considered to be a, a strong Jewish believer. Uh, it is what got them through the horrible atrocities that happened to their, them in their culture. And we are so grateful for who they are and what they have preserved to be here and today. So we are blessed by them. But here at this time, the Samaritans were not part, they were not considered a part and you, you kept away from them because they would the only word I can use in today's society is contaminate you. But they would, they would make you unclean. And so, I mean, you would just, you, you can't eat with them hmm. because wonder, they're unclean. I wonder what, we know what Jewish people thought of the Samaritans, but what did they think of the Jewish people? Did they have such animosity towards them? You or was they, it just that, oh, you bet they, oh, it's they, those guys that really don't like no, I mean, Come no, on, guys. <laughs> they had animosity because the Samaritans in this area this is where Jewish worship happened before everything got set up in Jerusalem. So there was all this going on. Okay. Well, it was in Jerusalem, and then it moved to here. I mean, you have to follow the timeline and pay attention to the dates. <laughs> You'll get really confused. Yeah. So here, we're going to just kind of give us the dump load. This area is the area where Elijah and Ahab and Jezebel, Jezebel, how's that for Jezebel. us? Make Jezebel, <laughs> which is such a popular name that we love to name mm -hmm. our, yeah. Mm -hmm. We had a car named Jezebel. Me and my sisters, and yeah, it was named that for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what that was. I wonder what that was. Mm. So I'm looking for, a, I think it's pronounced Ahaziah. Anyway, so here we have Ahab, we have Jezebel, they have a son named Ahaziah. And in the process, Jezebel was still alive at this time. He fell off a roof through this lattice and fell, and he sent his messengers to go ask the priest of what the Jews nicknamed Beelzebub, which became Lord of the Flies, that's what it meant, uh. but also was used as a image for, for the enemy, for Satan, in New Testament times. So this is what James and John here in Luke 9, 54, or in Luke 9, starting with 51, this they know, they know this story, this area they're walking through. So here Jesus and his rather large tribe of people are heading to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And they are going through Samaria because he ministers, he does this for a reason. And as the people who are in front of him going ahead, trying to find arrangements in different people's homes so that they can spend the night and then finish their, their, their uh, journey into Jerusalem, they're saying, no, you can celebrate God here. We have the stuff up on this mount. This is where it's been done for years. This is, and no, you can't, unless you're gonna stay here and celebrate, we don't want your money, keep moving on. All right, so it happened enough in this one area that James and John is like, Jesus, can you believe this, these Samaritans? Because this is where Elijah had this yeah. argument with Ahaziah. So Ahaziah sends, way back in history in the Old Testament, his messengers to the prophet of Satan and asking if he's gonna survive this calamity. And in route, t -t 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 they meet this man, this hairy man in this hairy outfit. And they don't even know who this guy is. And he's like, how could a king of Israel go and inquire here when there's a prophet of, of Yahweh? Blah, blah, blah. So the messenger goes back. Uh, yeah, I know. The, the sound, I'm making sound effects, Bruce. The messengers <laughs> go back to Hazei and say, we met this man on the road and he said this. And so Hazei, well, then I'm going to send troops. I'm sending army. Not to inquire, but to go arrest the guy and take him. So Elijah's not hiding. He's sitting on top of the mountain, and here comes the troops. Are you Elijah or whatever? And he says, well, if God says it is so, may fire from Yahweh come and consume you. Boom! All Oof. dead. <laughs> well, Hazy is thinking, what? You can only do that once. There's only so much power with that God, right? And so he sends another troop, and they march in there, and they do the exact same thing. And if that would be God, well, boom, fire from heaven come, and boom, they're all dead. Well, the third time... It takes the king a while. Ahaziah sends a crew. The commander of those troops begins to, or has understanding, 
outside <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, and imagine that. being that dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <gasps> yeah. <gasps> yeah. <gasps> to do what we said. I'm going to die either way. Mm-hmm. So I might as well see what I can do at this other end and, and beg for mercy. He goes and inquires. We would request that you travel with us, paying him the honor he is due. And the Lord tells Elijah to go and prophetically tell Ahaziah he's going to die of his injuries after telling him, you're a, you're a nincompoop. Here you have this amazing power, and you don't access it. And it's, it's known Elijah was kind of had disappeared. The messenger had no idea who this guy was at the beginning. So that mess happened in this area. So there's precedence for James and John to just like, these Samaritans haven't changed from way back then. All the stuff are, we've learned in school about them, they are just as headstrong, just as non-believing. They are just blah, blah. They have to have things their own way. They, and how dare they rebuke Jesus after he's done all these things to connect with them and, and work within their country to show that he loves them and that God loves them. And so, you know what, Jesus? Let's just ask the fire that Elijah brought down to come and consume them to show them what's what. <laughs> and so the question is, was John the one who led that, or was James the one who led that? Was it James being bold? Because I tell you, and very, if James had access to the upper part of society, which we think he did, and was very well educated as well as very well connected wealth, wealth-wise, he would have a lot of training and would feel justified leaning into his, his historical studies as well as being a leader in the community to make these types of decisions. And Jesus looks at him and says, you guys don't know what you're talking about. The Son of Man has come to save lives, not to destroy people's lives. That's, I am not here operating like Elijah. And this is way before the Mount of Transfiguration when James and John get to see Elijah and Moses come down and minister to Jesus. So that's a whole nother freaky out experience. So, that is part of who James is. We know he has part of this. Was he the one who led that statement? And John just followed along? Those of you who are younger siblings and you're later down in the birth order, you're going, yeah, of course. It's always the older sibling's fault. <laughs> <laughs> and those of you who are the older siblings saying, yeah, those young ones, they always hide behind us. Stand up for yourselves, guys. So we also know he came from a wealthy family, much more prestige in the community than probably some of the other apostles. And did James ever contend that, you know, in society, I'm looked at as the most important of this group of people? I really am. Because who my dad is, the uh, opportunities that I had, and we know that they were connected and well-established because they knew the high priest family on a personal basis. We find in John 18, 15 through 16, that Simon followed Jesus and so did another disciple, and that would have been John, James's younger brother. And since that disciple, which was John, was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But he had to go send someone to go get Peter. Peter couldn't come in. But John, the son of Zebedee, is requesting this man to be allowed into the courtyard. So that is James's world. He has that kind of clout in the Jewish society. And because they're wealthier, they would have clout in Roman society as well. Now, I remember reading 102 years ago that 10% of the Palestinian population controlled 90% of the wealth, and 90% of the population survived on 10% of the wealth. So were James and John closer to that 10%? Were they, was that their life? I don't know, but we know it was wealthier than most everybody else in their, uh, their town and their circle of influence. So there is some question whether or not Zebedee is from the tribe of Levi. Was that one of the reasons why they knew the high priest? All right, so there's that in James's head. This is who I am. This is who I am as I'm coming to meet Jesus and beginning my life as a disciple. Okay, he's not quite apostle yet. This is all the disciples part, getting to be the apostle. And then we also know there was this uh, discussion in Capernaum. This discussion happened in Mark 9. It also happens in Ma- or listed in Matthew 18 and in Luke 9 about who is the greatest of the apostles. Yeah. <laughs> well, ah, blah, 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 blah. well, Jesus asked me to sit next to him. Well, well, well I got to do this. So well, he sent me over here to run this errand. And then there's Judas. Well, I carry the money. Da-da. So they're having this argument. And then Jesus asked them about what were you arguing about on the way to Capernaum? And, and heading back to Capernaum is like going home. On the way home, what were you guys arguing about? And then he takes the opportunity to say, unless you are like a little child, and he gives that teaching. 
you have to, re uh, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And that is all part of that conversation. So Jesus is using that opportunity to teach and train this idea of what makes us great. Okay. Well, and I wonder, Pastor O, too, with it, you know, in that patronage system, if if this is their mindset, you know, as you brought in before, are they renegotiating for a different spot? You know, I want I want more of you. I, you know, how do I be more of a disciple of you? Can I be closer to you that oh, way? And that was accepted. Yeah. Because that was how you grew in society, was to earn your place up in the patronage system. And we know it's true because in Mark 10, there is James and John asking their mom to go talk to Jesus, <laughs> who could have been his auntie. So she could have said, you know, came up and Jesus said, hey, auntie Salome, you know, hey, can James and John sit next to you when you come into your kingdom, one at your right and running? You know, you guys play together so well as kids. They listen to you. They've got your back. They love you. You know, like every good auntie, mom. <laughs> and he laughs and he tells James and John, you don't know what you're, excuse me, James and John, you don't know what you're asking for. Only my father can designate those things. So that's part of James' personality. Is he thinking this idea that I deserve more? I deserve more. I think it should be James than Peter. Okay, so he's working the system, asking. Jesus is giving him teaching and training. And then they, in Luke 24, or excuse me, Luke 22, verses 24 through 30, they argue about who is the greatest apostle another time. It's a different argument than the one listed up in Mark 9. So, or in Luke 9, they have one argument. In Luke 22, they have another one. And let the greatest among you become the servant of all, because I'm coming as one who serves is what Jesus tells them. So is this significant? Is this unrest in here at this intensity because of James? I don't know. I have no idea. But when we look at his history and his standing in society, what little we know, it easily could be a very hard lesson to learn. That this is where everyone else tre treats me and expects me to fulfill these roles. And now I'm in this, and Jesus, you're asking me to do what? You're asking me to someone who isn't as wealthy as me, some, someone who doesn't wear as nice clothes as me, someone who isn't as educated as me, someone who gets us all in trouble when we go in public because he can't control his impulses. <laughs> you're expecting me to work underneath him? And you're giving him this unbelievable nickname that the rest of us can't even come close to. I mean, what is mm -hmm. up with you and Peter, Jesus? Mm -hmm. Did he have those kind of conversations when he was alone with him? James was definitely respected and looked up to. He had a lot of talent. But is... That little core, sometimes when you feel you have been wronged and someone didn't quite get you, mm -hmm. did James struggle with that? Mm -hmm. If any of them did, it would have been him. Mm -hmm. And all of the things we're talking about are just part of human nature. Mm -hmm. they're, they're in all of us. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at James and seeing that understanding. Now, if you look at in Mark 3, 16 through 19, and Acts 1, 13, in both of those, they list the apostles. Now, in Acts 1.13, it has to be in the New King James Version. But in those listing, they list Peter and then they list James. And all of those lists are very important, the order that they go down, because <laughs> it's part of the patronage system. I'm sorry to laugh. I'm just reading the list. And sure enough, Philip is number five. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do a Philip color. You know what? I love when you read that. But now, as I'm learning, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, mm -hmm. I can state it was stated there. <laughs> but there's Philip, number five. You know? There's a crew that, it's my sister's hiking crew, and I was so blessed to be invited to join them. And there are six of us who have hiked together for years. And we have a patronage system. The general, our leader, Jeanette, she, one of the ladies got us thing shirts, you know, Dr. Seuss's thing, bright red with mm -hmm. thing, thing, and one. she's thing one. Thing I'm one. thing five, so uh -oh. hey, I'm Philip. so <laughs> here, here we go. <laughs> yeah. And we would hike with them in the woods on the, you know, North Shore, so it was always fun. Uh, six crazy old ladies and then these guys or groups of whatever walk by us and if it was families they'd laugh but if it was just a group of guys hiking they look at us like I, I don't get it and it's like well good yeah <laughs> and we would sing the ants go marching and things like that in the woods because you know this year there's a lot of people in the woods but the years we've been out there for years we don't meet a whole lot of people on the trail so we can sing as loud as we want because none of us <laughs> sing all that great so there we go there is philip number five <laughs> sorry no, I think it's great. I mean, it's, and that's part of this idea of study in one area. You're picking up things about others that are filing into your head that'll mm -hmm. come to connection when you actually mm -hmm. go in and study them more uh, 
magnified in a magnified manner. So here we're back to James. And he was in that top triad, the circle of three. He is, appears to be listed after Peter towards the end of things, and that, that is his Peter. If, if it's not Peter, then go talk to James. And Andrew and John are there, but they're doing their things. We have decided Andrew was the systems man. That's why we don't see him. He's out creating, and he loves sharing his faith. So we have Andrew busy doing that, and we see John taking care of Jesus' needs. That's what I see. Whatever Jesus needed, John would go take care of. Any of these personal requests, I think John knew how to keep his mouth shut. Mm. So he also did. And then when he wrote his gospel, <laughs> when he wrote the gospel of John, they actually, Christian history says, we need you to tell what you know because mm -hmm. the synoptic gospels don't give enough of the personal information about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that is when he could, and he was. He was extremely blunt about his opinion of Judas Iscariot. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that wasn't listed. I mean, he was blunt in your face. So that is conversation we've already had. And now we talked about them being in the different groups that we mentioned earlier. Now we're coming to where the controversy arose last night when I stated could this Jerusalem Council, <clears throat> which happened in AD 49, been led by James the Great? Because I read a quote out of, and I have it, because it bugged me so much when I got home last night, because I could remember, I took a picture in my brain. And it is taken out of the Nelson's New Christian Dictionary, written by G.T. Curian. Great dictionary, love it. But this is where James the Greater seems to come in. And here it says, James, uh, St. James the Great, No, James, the son of the, okay, now I have to read it. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> the Jerusalem Council, Apostle San Diego, the son of the Lord, according to the Spanish legend. Okay. okay, I'm having the same reaction I had last night. <laughs> Yes, here we go. The Jerusalem Council, First Apostolic Council of the Christian Church, held in Jerusalem, headed by St. James the Great. Mm. All right? So, because it said St. James, I thought it meant James the Greater. So apparently uh, there is my uh, error. Mm. So, I tell you, okay. it can goof me up. Too mm -hmm. much information overload. Yes, I know. Well, and it's not like they've all agreed. You know, some yes. of them are saying it here, and then they're saying oh, it a little I bit know. different here. And I uh, know. Don't use James the Greater unless you mean Saint John's James, yes. brother. So yeah. we have the Jerusalem Council and the different things that happened there and how they made decisions. But that was led by Jesus' brother, James, okay. yep. who also worked with Peter. And, and James, St. James, Jesus' brother, was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem where John ended up being the pastor of the church in Ephesus, the Gentile church. So here we have that going on, and they were trying to come up with this idea of how to connect all of the Gentile churches that have developed and how they can have true fellowship with the Hebrew churches, the, the Jewish churches, because some of the behavior, some of the normal everyday things, much like the Samaritans, were against Jewish law. So they couldn't eat together, they couldn't fellowship together in ways. So they realized this is a problem in the church. So do Christians need to get become Jews before, do they have to observe the Mosaic law before they can become a Christian? Do you have to do all of these things, get circumcised, all that stuff before you can become a Christian? Now this sounds like, what are they talking about? This argument still, not with these specifics, but people argue about this stuff all the time. Uh, well, no, you can't do this, and, and believe, you know you have to do this, or you can't be part of us. Or you, it's like this is human nature, and so this argument that we see some in the personality in James, this is just normal human behavior arguing about this is what we know, this is what we've been taught. Don't you tell me that now we've lived all this way. This is what has created and given us our cultural identity, and you're telling me these people can just believe in Jesus? And so they went through and they had this council and they had this very long conversation and it happened in AD 49. We know that James was martyred in somewhere around AD 44, 44 43, yeah. somewhere in there. So if he was heading yeah. this up, he would have been there in a resurrected form. So <laughs> since that is not, <laughs> not the case. Yeah, that's not the case. So here we have the council going on. But that we're going to remove. We did talk about it last night because I thought 
it, it should be talked about because they list him as the lead, not doing my timeline research. But they end up, what is interesting about this argument is they end up with this statement and I can't remember who made the statement about happening here in Acts chapter 15, that we don't want to burden you with all of these laws. That's not our goal with this council. What does it mean to be a Christian? What did Jesus say? This is how you are a believer of me. Do you, do you need to be baptized to be a Christian? The answer is no. It's an outward sign after you, you make a decision to be in love with Jesus and the baptism is a sign that you've done this. So it de declares to all of society, I have married Jesus, I love Jesus, I am committed to him and his teachings in scripture. So they are having this, and so they come up with this list, and this was an interesting conversation because this is the process that James had to go through, even though he wasn't alive to reach this end. They asked them to not eat meat with blood in it. Okay, don't eat raw meat. <laughs> not eat animals which have been strangled. I know. I can't can, remember. How can't doggone rem often does that actually yeah, happen? Like, yeah. That yeah. you had to. Uh, uh, anyway. Strangle uh, the strangle, oh, Yeah, and, and to not eat food that had been sacrificed to idols. Okay. Mm -hmm. And not to commit sexual immorality. So these are taken from Leviticus 17 through 18. So why did they give this list? I mean, what was up with this list? I mean, mm -hmm. this is a really weird list right. from us looking back. I know historically at the time it wasn't weird, but. So, so what's going on here? And it's like, as I'm reading it, it is comedic to us, laughing. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, Christian loving Jesus, I can't eat raw meat. Does that include sushi? I mean, is that a sushi? I mean, what were, were they saying? This is what makes you holy. And this is, we're still in this argument today. Mm -hmm. What makes you holy? What may, it's like, I have to tell you, Jesus is what gives us righteousness. It is imputed on us by his death, burial, and resurrection. It is him. We live out of an act of love and mm -hmm. obedience because we love him, not because it buys us real estate in the kingdom of heaven. It's this idea it doesn't make, they gave this list for a reason. What do you guys think the reason was they gave the list? Well, it came up last night. It was not my original idea that it, what's the term? Uh, so that you wouldn't be a stumbling block to Good other word. people. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Which yeah. I think was Gareth there that uh, yeah. Yeah. responded yeah. on it a yeah. little bit more. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. Any other? Pastor Robin? Uh, I would have really enjoyed being at this council just to watch. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, because I can see yeah. like heads exploding because Almost definitely. for someone to say, you, all you got to do is believe in Jesus, it's like, wait a minute, that's step that's, 15. That's just, How do oh, you get to yes. step 15? That's right. We, that's right. You got to start back here at the beginning. Like, that's wait, right. what? Yes. So I can certainly understand that not making sense because this is the only progression we know. Y'all are skipping all kinds of stuff. You're missing the journey. Yeah. yeah. It, so. all, it really holds true today mm -hmm. how many unbelievers that really the seed's been planted but mm -hmm. they don't want to go to church because they, oh, i'm just mm -hmm. too sinful i just right you know I, don't I do tell anyone wrong. but i eat meat sacrificed to idols yeah you know it's if they yeah. knew that i was raised on blood sausage when i was <laughs> a yes. child it's oh right. no am i doing right. here it's yes. a, yeah. Well, and it's interesting because you brought up in the past how many of those conversations that you have we call the confessional. Yes. You know, some people just need to come in and go, can I still be accepted because I watch Grey's Anatomy? Or can I still be accepted because <laughs> yeah. I do this? Or can I, you know, this yes. was in my past. Can I still be a part yes. here? You know, yes. I, I like to play cards. I mean, Oh, no. yeah, my grandma was, oh, mm-mm. No Makes cards, you a gypsy. No. <laughs> <laughs> and she's Finnish. It's not like she's even, you know, Greek or anything. It's like a Romanian. I mean, she was Finnish, and it's like, I don't know where you got that, Grandma, but that's funny. Yeah. 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 Well, and it's interesting because there's bigger things. I mean, this seems like such a, um, I don't know, innocuous list. I mean, it's hard to put it in cultural standing what it would be equitable to today. Mm -hmm. But we do have that. We've had individuals come with the confessional that they were told if they have tattoos, they're going to hell. And it's a misunderstanding of an Old Testament scripture that tells you not to trim the corners of your beards nor get tattoos. But those tattoos were s signs of, of worshiping the, your dead ancestors. So don't worship your dead ancestors. So they come and they, you know, 
the uh, horrific abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't this kick me out of the kingdom of God? Because, yeah, that happened to me as a child, but now as an adult, I have done this. And it's like, no, repentance is a beautiful thing. It creates this clean slate. And that's where the argument was amazing because here, the Samaritans hear the message. Now, remember how mad James and John were. Call down the fire from heaven in the Samaritans. But these Samaritans keep getting saved. They don't just keep getting saved. They get baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues that everybody's mind is blown. Paul's like, well, if the Holy Spirit is going to do this, who are we to say they can't be Christians? I mean, come on, guys. So Paul is our, our bedrock. And he had to get in Peter's face, but we'll be on that one in a few weeks. And tell, blah, blah, blah. So here's this amazing argument. So what does this argument look like in today's culture? What do we argue over that, no, you need to do this to be a Christian or to be a better Christian? We like that one. No, this makes you a Christian, but if you want to be, yeah, a yeah, better. Wear your suit to church. Oh, wear oh, your yeah. suit. Oh, oh, that's right. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then does that mean I have to wear a dress and put my hair in a bun? Because there is that Pentecostal bun. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, and not making fun of people's things and traditions that help them feel right. better. Mm -hmm. You can have traditions all that you want. And this council proves that, mm -hmm. that understand each other's traditions, but don't you dare say they make you holier mm -hmm. or that they make you more of a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the new things, it's not really new, but it's a Pentecostal evangelical church thing is people are really getting into embracing Jewish style worship mm -hmm. and they believe if you blow a shofar and if you do all of this stuff I don't mind or care if you do that but don't you go saying it makes anybody more holy or that it helps you tap into God better yes. than not having done it right it makes your worship more intense or more mm -hmm. personal it mm -hmm. is a bridge to deeper when people start using the word deeper <laughs> warning warning <laughs> warning Will Robinson mm -hmm. it's like no it's Jesus's death burial and resurrection that gives us the intimacy and Amen. is the bridge into a relationship mm -hmm. Then after that, it's one thing, obedience. Do what the Bible tells you to do. It's like this idea of all these extra things. So we still deal with that today. And so this is what happened in the Jerusalem Council. So now we know that this is James. There isn't a whole lot more. There's one more thing said about him that I thought was beautiful. And it doesn't come from scripture. It's an extra biblical, short, uh, extra biblical source. But before we got there, we listed some of the things. No, we did that first. And then after that, we listed them. Uh, James's life came to an end somewhere around a year. Oh, we have a mouse coming in. Yes, the mouse I'm married to, <laughs> who loves birthday cake. Twinkies, yes. That's We're not a mouse. Oh, yeah. Sometimes that's a rat. <laughs> I'm a, a, a big mouse. <laughs> a big mouse. Yeah, it's yes. not a mouse, a rat. Yeah, well, you're trying to be quiet and sneak in. I'm not sure well, why. Well, He's then attempting. You call attention to it, so. Well, it's not like they can't see you because there's cameras on, so there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, so here, Pastor Mike. James is looking for this, this crown of glory. He wants to be esteemed and seen. We know that was where he started. But like every one of the apostles, he started one place, but he grew. Jesus had a plan. And that's why I think the Sons of Thunder comment was mm -hmm. a warning, boys. Yes. We're going to yes. use that passion and intensity to bring you to a place that's going to change the world. Mm -hmm. And did they... Jesus is trusting me to do that. Somewhere in there, James had to get and grapple and get his mind wrapped around this. Peter may be seen as the leader, but I am James. I am James. And even though he wanted this crown of glory because maybe he was do this in his standing in society, he ended up with suffering. He wanted power and Jesus gave him serving. Okay, he wanted prominence and Jesus gave him the martyr's grave. I mean, his life was his life not was his life not uh, great enough? Mm -hmm. And then we look at John the Baptist being martyred in his 30s. Jesus died in his 30s. So James had a 14 years of knowing Jesus and then living as an apostle, 14 years of ministry, of growing. And in Acts 2, 1 through 3, we see what happens in the end of James's story. Here we see that Herod the king, he decided to try and manipulate not that we would know anything about political manipulation, but manipulate society. And he wanted to decide to arrest James. And it could be because of James's fiery disposition that he was extremely visible. And it's like, we're going to go arrest him. And when he's seen how happy that made everybody, he decides to kill him. So he dies a martyr's death and he's beheaded with the sword. And because they love that, he goes and arrests Peter. Well, it's interesting here in Acts 12, we find out that the Holy Spirit comes Peter's sleeping in the prison and he's shackled to two guards and something's poking at him 
which it's funny because Peter falls asleep a lot in scripture. <laughs> and poking at him and say, Peter, get up. And the, the chains go, put on your sandals, get your cloak. And the angel leads him out. So why didn't that happen for James? Why, why, did, the, why, why did Peter again get, did James come to, and it appeared he came to understand what God was using him for, his role in society. And Eusebius, a Christian historian, a historian lists that James went to his death and the individual that was leading him to, they call it something, leading him to where he was going to be beheaded. They, they, there's a name for that place. And that person watching James's God control, watching James's countenance, watching his ability to accept, my death is going to sing because he is the first apostle that is martyred. And however he composed himself, that individual confessed there at that moment, according to Eusebius, that he is also a believer in Christ, and they were beheaded together mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. So here we see this is James at the, end of, at the end of his life, going to be with Jesus, and we know where he started. So how did this happen? What was this process? And here is where we decided to, we, we um, began our wonderful list of words, and I didn't say just one word, I could said you can make a statement or a byline that encapsulate who you think James is. So what were some of the words that Cheyenne wrote on the board for us last night? And we got here one at the bottom, humble. Humble, I, I think, I'm not sure, it, I don't see it on here, but it's a word I just mm -hmm. thought of that as he's walking there. Mm -hmm. He was con completely content. That's uh, a good one, yes. That's a good word. Yes, I, I have and, done, yep. And I think I know why. Mm -hmm. He's the first one to go. Yep. Mm -hmm. First one to go up there and see Jesus up yeah. there and with those two empty thrones. <laughs> and I'm first. Uh, yeah, yes, hey. Yeah, hey, Jesus, yes. Well, this idea of I am going to have a light that shines specifically in this area, watching the, the uh, mastery of Jesus organizing society. <laughs> and the mouse has left the room. <laughs> Just, just go away. <laughs> yes, but this idea of content, that had oh, to be yeah. part of what undid that servant that was leading him to his death. Yeah. Yes. What other things do we have listed? Intense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a little bit intense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're walking to your death, and mm -hmm. that would be, I can't think of anything more intense than that. That's mm -hmm. this. Yes. The and being so composed. Right. This yeah. mm -hmm. composed power. Mm -hmm. So all this passion that he had, it was, it was learned to be harnessed. Mm. It was learned to be harnessed for a specific reason, to proclaim not James's name, but the name of Christ. What other things do we have on there, or words that you wanted to share last night but didn't because we don't do, try not to do most of the talking when it gets to Q&A time? I think another, I'm not sure what, there's got to be a word for it. I don't know the word. Not just faith, but a super faith or, or belief. I'm not sure what. Like you know, a God he, confidence. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. that He, mm -hmm. he just had something that is beyond mm. description almost. Mm -hmm. To be able to yeah. walk there, come on, it's okay, it's okay. But he was yeah. probably comforting the yes. person yes. that's mm -hmm. leading him to his death. And it's yes. like, wow. Mm -hmm. This knowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it did help that they seen the resurrected Christ. Exactly. So mm -hmm. he knows he's just yeah. transitioning. Mm-hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, well, I'm mm -hmm. getting rid of this, and mm -hmm. now I get to go to that place mm -hmm. where Jesus is. One of the phrases that comes into my mind, or one of the words now, is resignation. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean resignation as in rolling over and playing dead, but it seems like, you know, and, and we've had this conversation about today. There's when God lays out in front of you, this, this is who I'm asking you to be, this is how I'm asking you to show up, yeah. this is what I want to do with your life um and at some measure we die to that you know these are the dreams that i had jesus this is what i want to do yes and we let those go and embrace what god has for us and it seems to me with what we study with his life that somewhere along the line there was that sweet resignation mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. i am going to embrace who you say i am what you say you have for me to do that that's what brings you glory most not my dreams mm -hmm. and so j I, it's so honoring to me yeah. um in how he's choosing to live his life with god mm. 
I think of the word submission. Yeah. You know, we all yeah. love that one, especially mm-hmm. women. We just love that word. <laughs> mm-hmm. And understanding what it really means. Right. This, I, this resignation of honoring Jesus. And this is where I submit. Yeah, trusting. Yes. Mm-hmm. I like that sweet resignation. Not mm-hmm. a resignation of depression, but a right. resignation of obedience. Yeah. I am trusting you, Jesus. And so I'm going to do this, which mm-hmm. is a life of faith. Amen. Anyone who loves Jesus, you know what that's like. Mm-hmm. Um, there was the phrase, a true disciple. He knew who he was. He was raised to know who he was. And it, there's nothing wrong with being proud of your heritage and who you are. Mm-hmm. But how do I take that and honor Christ with that? Mm-hmm. How do I submit that and allow it to become what Christ designed me to be? He's not trying to cap me and turn me into something I'm not. He's mm-hmm. trying to release who I am in a way where it glorifies him, but also helps others grow and takes care of it. Because it's not about us. It's about community and about loving Christ Mm -hmm. and understanding who we've been designed to be and that we have a creator that has made us and all of these things. So James, what he was fighting for at first, he had 14 years of learning Mm -hmm. to get to the place where where he went to his death. It's like, well, this must be my time. Mm -hmm. Either that sword's going to break in half Mm -hmm. or I'm going to go see Jesus. Mm -hmm. The humbleness of that. Yes, yes. The maturity. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> where, you know, the tipping point of growth, where did he get to the point and start, okay, I give up. Mm-hmm. It's not about me. Mm-hmm. Let me. It's not about me and Peter at all. Mm-hmm. This is, I, I mean, this is crazy. When they started seeing other people getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, when they experienced that in Acts chapter 2, they had to be just, this is nutty. You mean Jesus, this is what Jesus tapped into? This is what he was talking about? God's going to provide? This is nutty. I wonder how many sick people were healed in mm-hmm. the next 30 days after mm-hmm. that. Because that is a huge piece of what mm-hmm. people understood Jesus' care for them. Because there was no way their life was going to get better. They're going to die with this because there was no way to cure it. It either would be handled by a miracle or it was going to stay. So I, I wonder in my great imagination that how, what happened when they went back to where they lived? How many sick people lined outside their doors? Because news traveled. They rarely were more than a day away from their hometown. So it traveled. And so is this James's tipping point when he started to realize there's so much to do? Why argue about placement? Just mm-hmm. do what Jesus designed you to do. Mm-hmm. Is that where it started to tumble? Mm-hmm. And that was part of the conversation, too, of this is not a negative conversation. Mm-hmm. I mean, James is someone to be her- uh, heralded and honored for what he brought, and it is true. But I love having the conversation about personality mm-hmm. because he's a real person. He did not get appointed an apostle and ta-da! No, he was a follower, he was a disciple, and then Jesus called him into being an apostle. And in the, the weight of that calling, the true mature James showed up. So we ended last night with this reading, this is something that James, I think James's personality is tied here in Acts chapter 4. This is before James had died, so he was part of this experience, experience. But they had just seen Peter and John being released, being arrested for healing someone. And everybody's going crazy. And the Jewish high council's having a fit. We thought we got rid of this when we had Jesus killed. And here we go. And blah, 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 blah. All of this going on. And they warn them, but they're afraid to kill him because... They don't want civil unrest. So they warn them to stop this. And, and Peter's like, well, how can we? We're only saying the things that we've seen and heard and know. So they end and let them out and chide them severely. So when they come back to the crew, they come back to the other apostles and the other disciples hanging out and it tell them what happened. <laughs> and it says here in Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 23, read this as a prayer and we ended in a, in a prayer for what they prayed for in this portion of scripture and all i am thinking is here is james finding his fit he mm. is naturally good at what they're praying for because it's in his dna he is this person passion that has been put in not a constraint passion that has been put in a direction that is going to love others while you love jesus when they were released Peter and John, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, and then they go on through some other verses talking about, God, you knew this. You ordained this process for Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. This is going on in the Old Testament, and now we see your hand in all of this is what they're saying. In this city, these things had happened. And then going, starting at verse 29, here is the prayer part. 
And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants. They understood their lives were at stake. Tipping point. To continue, they're not asking for safety. To continue to speak your word with all boldness. I'm wondering if James is praying this. All right, speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and, signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. Okay, here it goes again. Here we go again. And they all were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So when I look at the life of James, I see that passion and intensity. But to me, James represents this boldness here in Acts chapter 4. What a journey for this amazing personality that in society we would say is super successful. But Jesus is saying you need to learn about loving others and then you're going to find out what it means to have boldness and to be a leader and to understand what it means to be part of a culture. And he passed the test with a great big A as we read about his martyrdom at the end of his unfortunately too short of life but not too short because that is what uh, Jesus has outlined for his, mm -hmm. his contribution because mm -hmm. his martyrdom changed also. They realized, yes, they realized here in Acts 4 and then in Acts 12 when he was beheaded that, yep, we knew this would be coming. They figure, I think, somewhere in there from this point there was, was it 10 more years? There was 10 years mm -hmm. from here until James was martyred. So 10 years of speaking with boldness before he opened the door and showed the rest of the apostles how to die with dignity. So with that, I have a question for us as we close this morning, this afternoon or this evening, depending on what time you're watching or listening, as we close this podcast. How bold are you? How bold are you? How bold are you? And what is it attached to? Are you a bold parent? Are you a, a bold artist? Are you a bold writer? I know, you're a bold political commentator. <laughs> or you're a bold conspiracy theorist. And the way we find out what we're bold about, is, it's what we talk about, it's the t-shirts we wear, it's, the, it's what consumes our thoughts and our study. So what are you bold about? And for those who are in love with Jesus, there's only one answer. And that that makes me wonder, have I reached my tipping point? Have I come to the place in my life where I will be submissive to the Lord's will, realizing the boldness that I have, whether it be a tiny little microscopic piece or a great big loud in your face piece, is that boldness used for loving others in Jesus' name? Thank you for joining us for this week's discussion on Who Are the Apostles? Today, introducing James the Greater. To enjoy this process live, come join us and the Wednesday Night Crew every Wednesday evening at 6.30 at Maranatha's Forest Lake Campus. This is Steve Lundy reminding you to always be kind.